Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody is having a wonderful morning and enjoying the sunshine the way that I am. It's lovely to see all of you uh, on our Zoom call today. Uh, as you know, this is our Saturday morning virtual tour of the museum's workshop. I'm Aliyah Venick. I'm the events manager at the Science Museum of Minnesota. And as you know, this event is part of Member Appreciation Month. It's our way of saying, Thank you for your continued support of our mission to make science education accessible to everyone. Before we begin, I'm going to share a few reminders about Zoom. First of all, the best way to see the presenter and the slides that we're presenting today is by choosing speaker view, which is in the upper right of your Zoom screen. Uh, you're all muted right now, and I'll ask you to keep your microphones off for the duration of the program, though we will have time for a Q&A toward its conclusion, and you can use the chat window in the bottom to share, share your thoughts and questions. Thank you. Today's program explores the elements of our museum's workshop, a space staffed by museum fabricators and builders who create unique experiences for our museum and others. I'd like to begin with a very short video by our media specialist, Guy Dalby Thomas, to help set the tone. And you're just gonna have to bear with me here for the technical part of the program. <laughs> I think it's so fun to see all the amazing creations that were developed right in our building uh, at the Science Museum. Uh, and now to tell us a little bit more about the workshop and some of the projects that are currently in production, I would like to introduce our host today, Andrew Urch. So Andrew, oops. Uh, Andrew joined the exhibit production team as a fabricator in 2012, and he has served as director of the department since 2018. Andrew orchestrates the day-to-day -day operations of exhibit production departments with 17 fabricators, three exhibit maintenance staff, and over 20,000 square feet of production capacity. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Aaliyah, and, and thank you all uh, members for joining me this morning. Uh, I'm coming to you right now from four stories uh, below the lobby of the Science Museum. I'm down in the exhibit production shop. Uh, and I'm going to approach this as I would an in-person tour. Uh, I'm going to show you some uh, photos of the production space and then kind of talk through uh, what our processes are like. So I'm just going to jump right in and then uh, look forward to fielding questions when we get to the end of the tour. All right. So we're going to start in the main workshop. Uh, and uh, on site here, uh, down on the first level of the museum, uh, we're built on a hillside. So the first floor is actually the sub basement. Uh, we have a large space, over 8,000 square feet of our, our main production area. Uh, it's filled with a lot of different tools, a lot of materials, and then a lot of work in progress. Uh, the main thing that people notice when they come to the shop, lots of different tools. People are always impressed with the tool wall uh, from hand tools uh, to all the different woodworking equipment, all the hardware that we have and just bins and bins. You'll, you'll find uh, over 20,000 square feet of space gets very full between all our, our workshops, spaces, uh, the benches that the fabricators work off of and everything that's in process, all of our materials. Here's a shot of one of our two table saws we have down in the shop. On the left, you'll see a shot down our first floor corridor that runs the, the whole width of the building. And even the hallway is filled with work that's in progress. 
uh, and things that are getting ready to go up on the floor or have just come off the floor for testing uh, or things that are in early prototype stages. To the right, you'll see the main workshop space, which is where the woodworking takes place. And this is a shot from our offsite warehouse and production facility, which is over 18,000 square feet. This was uh, in preparation for the Maya exhibit that we produced a few years ago. This is, that's back in 2012, but jam packed. Uh, all, all its square footage was, was filled with production at that point. One thing a lot of people don't realize is uh, we produce exhibits both for the Science Museum of Minnesota uh, and for our tours, which go throughout uh, the US and Canada. And we, we build exhibits for other institutions throughout the world. So back in our shop, we can see in this slide uh, work that we're producing for three different museums. Uh, to the right, there's a, a large standing column. That, that's that's going to house uh, a, a hologram that's being produced for a museum in Kuwait. Uh, further back, there's a uh, it looks like a large piece of cardboard. Uh, that one that one is a, an early prototype for a museum in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, and that one is explaining directional drilling for uh, fracking of uh, gas and mining of oil. And then to the left, we're going to uh, get a little closer to the one on the far left. You see, it looks like just a black piece of glass that you can't see through. Uh, this is another one for the a museum in Kuwait. And what we see here is a little to the left, a little. Uh, scope that we 3D printed, and then that black piece of glass. So this is talking about how night vision cameras work. So we can't see through the glass now, but if we hold up the little the little handheld uh, camera, what, what we see is the image of uh, what we see is what's behind the the uh, opaque glass. That's two little two little Lego buildings, uh, and so this gives uh, a person uh, the experience of what it's like to use night vision goggles. Uh, but we can do it in a, a lit museum setting and no one has to put on a headset. So uh, this, is a, this is an early prototype of, of that experience. Now we're joining uh, two of our fabricators at a workbench, Tai Chang, uh, and this is Kate Swanson, uh, and they're working together on uh, a prosthetic hand and kind of showing how this works. And so every time you press the button, the hand will uh, initiate a program and do a different uh, movement. So it could be a grip or it could be uh, signaling. Uh, and so this is made with a combination of off the shelf parts, like the little blue actuators that can move cables up back and forth. And then the hand itself is all 3D printed on site. And here's, here's some close ups. So uh, this is a, this is again, another early prototype. We haven't yet tested it in front of visitors looking forward to doing that, but, uh, this is done through a combination of a lot of 3D drafting to figure out how it's all gonna work and then building the first prototype and testing it out. We do a lot of modeling, uh, 3D design to try to figure out how things work first in a virtual environment before we start uh, committing to building something out of steel. Uh, this is uh, Dave Bailey's workbench, one of our most ex experienced fabricators. He's working on a prototype for uh, a powered suit that would allow you to uh, do more work without getting tired. So here he has a, a prototype built. He's he's holding on a little grip and lifting a, a weight. And it, it, you know it, it, you can feel the weight of it. It causes a certain amount of strain. And then if you squeeze the little green strip, then it, it becomes powered. And so you can lift a, a lot more without uh, exerting yourself at all. So. Uh, these are already being uh, developed for people that work in the trade, so you can, uh, you know, be framing out a house and not not get tired as you work all day, uh, and prevent injury for people that are doing repetitive lifting. And uh, so this is a an early prototype for that experience. Now we move from the main workshop. We're moving into the metal shop now, so we have the full capability to do welding, uh, plasma cutting, uh, and even older techniques. We have our anvil here. We could, we can. Uh, forge things as needed. Got a lot of material in-house all the time. Here's one of our fabricators welding up a steel structure. And here's a piece that uh, it's, it's a double helix that's uh, for a, a, a DNA uh, interactive that we're building.
One thing I wish I could share with you now is all, all the, the, the sounds and the smells of being in the shop <laughs> between uh, you know, smelling fresh cut lumber and, and hearing people uh, grinding away and welding and everything. It's, it's a fun part of the process, but uh, we're moving now from the metals area into the machining uh, space. Uh, you're going to see in the machining area, we have machines that are uh, some of them World War II era. Uh, they're capable of making really precise uh, uh, cuts on material, and uh, it's still a hand process. Uh, but that, that's what we really need, that ability to make uh, parts that are, that are uh, within a thousandth of an inch so they, everything meshes perfectly and works like it needs to. Uh, and we're building a lot of one-off parts. So uh, we, we need this capability to make, make these uh, using all these machining tools. This is kind of a hybrid tool here. You see this old Bridgeport mill. So it can make really precise, precisely located holes in, and cut material. But then we have a... a a digital readout on the side that we've added. So uh, we're kind of combining the old hand process of having to turn cranks and pull levers to get things adjusted to a readout that is uh, digital and, and perfectly precise. Here's our other mill. And then we have some other old tools here that have found a second life. This saw is actually uh, originally designed, uh, it's a linotype saw. So it's for cutting lead type for a printing press. But this saw, this saw is an invaluable tool for cutting aluminum and plastics. Uh, and uh, it's found a second life in our shop. Here we have a lathe for turning. So we, we could even make our own bolts if we needed to. We can make threads on, on, uh, on different, different parts. And I'm going to show you some pieces later that we uh, uh, built using these machine tools. Here's our electronic shop. Uh, we do have to work a lot with discrete electronics and wire up uh, capacitors and resistors and make our own uh, boards for the, the different uh, exhibits that we make. And there's a, a more recent addition, a 3D printer. So this is where we produce the parts for that uh, prosthetic hand that you saw in the video and in the slides earlier. And this experience I'm showing now on the left is for uh, a children's museum in Tulsa, and we're building them uh, a rain curtain. So similar to the, the bubble wall in our lobby, where the, the bubbles make uh, an image. It's like one bubble is like a pixel in a larger image. This, this uh, experience we're building will be a, a, a 40 foot long curtain of little droplets. And each of the little tubes runs to a valve that is controlled by a computer, and it can time the drops so that it can make an image and it, as the drops fall. And so we're, we're prototyping that. We have to wait until it warms up a little bit so we could fire this up outside and, and test it. Uh, water exhibits are a real challenge to do because of just the, the amount of mess uh, that they make. Another tool we rely heavily on is a laser cutter. Uh, this allows us to etch material and make really uh, extremely precise cuts on material. And the, the image you see here on the right, uh, it's, it's a little hard to tell what it is, but it's, it's a picture of nine Supreme Court justices. This is, these are little tiny uh, printed images that we cut out precisely and it's going in a diorama for the new skin exhibit that we're opening here. Uh, if people come after the 26th or on the 26th or after, you'll get to see that uh, in place. Uh, this tool is great for us because we can uh, prototype with plastic material, try a part out before we uh, build the, the finished piece in metal a lot of times. Here's our finishing space. So we do uh, all our sanding of wood and, and painting in this space. So you see a lot, of, a lot of square footage, a lot of different tools. But one of the most important pieces of this whole process for us is, is the collaboration. So it takes a lot of people to make exhibits. It's not just the people down in the shop. Uh, it takes uh, designers to come up with the, the shape of something, developers to decide on the idea uh, and, and uh, help move it forward until it gets down to the shop where we'll try to take this first idea and, and make it real, uh, make the real objects. This is a early prototype for a, uh, an entry space for the Maya exhibit. Uh, but one of the most critical pieces whether it's collaborating with scientists and outside advisors, other institutions, our own collection staff, 
and the experts we have in-house in other departments. Uh, a vital piece is uh, the public. So you, the members, and the other visiting public that can uh, come and help take the idea that we have and, and make it go from uh, just a proof of concept to a finished exhibit uh, that is durable and safe and compelling. Uh, and so I'm going to show you a few images now of, of what that process is like. So on the right here, we'll zoom in on this piece. Uh, this is talking about blood pressure. And so what you could do is take your hand and like it shows in the image, squeeze the little uh, membrane and you can feel what it, what it would feel like if, if a heart is under a normal, normal amount of blood pressure or someone with high blood pressure and how hard the heart has to work to pump blood through your body. And we made all these pieces in house uh, out of acrylic. So you can see the, the large pump there. It's all used the, the machines uh, that I showed you earlier. So the mills uh, to make this really precise piece. But what we do is start off with this proof of concept. So uh, we, have, we have the exhibit. It's just made out of uh, plywood and a simple hand-drawn image right now. So we can get it out in front of the public and test how it works. Because this is where this is where we really uh, take an idea and make it real. It, it has to be uh, involving our visitors because they're the ones that let us know instantly whether our idea makes sense to the public, whether we can, uh, you know, provide an engaging experience and one that's going to be safe and durable. And uh, it's it's a, just a vital part of the process. And here we have uh, one that we're developing for a museum up in. Bismarck, North Dakota. So uh, kind of the experience a, a veterinarian has uh, seeing how this cow is doing. So it starts off as a, a very simple hand-drawn image on a board and it has some sensors that uh, visitors can interact with. And we just kind of figure out the flow of, of the experience uh, and then take it back down to our workshop and, and move it to the next stage of being a more refined exhibit we still don't have the finished graphics, but this is where we're at, where it's, you know, you have the actual cow that you can uh, test it on this board first in front and then test it on the cow and hold it up and listen to the, the cow's stomach and, and see if it's, uh, if it's healthy. So that, that's the main part of walking through our exhibit and uh, walking through the process. Uh, and I, I'd like to uh, go on to answer some questions about uh, how we work and, and, and the workshop. Thank you, Andrew. That was wonderful. I have to say uh, to all of you, and actually at this point, if you want to stop sharing your screen too, then we can all see okay, sure, sorry. Your, your face large. <laughs> um, so, I, oh yeah, keep the screen share. <laughs> so um, I'm going to remind all of you, I just chatted. Uh, if you can chat your questions in the in the chat, I'll read those off and facilitate that conversation with Andrew. Uh, and I just want to say as a Science Museum staff member, there's so many uh, wonderful perks to our job. But in normal times, sometimes staff get to be the testers too. And one of my favorite things about working at the museum is going down and getting to test things in the workshop. It's, it's just super fun and I'm always impressed with what you and your your team can do. Uh, so actually we kind of talked through a good warm-up question for Andrew and Andrew if you can share with us one of your favorite exhibits to work on and, and why that would be sure good. absolutely. Uh, so prior to uh, starting work in museums I was a potter for 10 years uh, and I it was really exciting for me after starting up here uh, and beginning to build exhibits to, to bring those skills uh, to bear on one of our exhibits. So uh, here we have, it's, it's not the best image, but this is a, uh, an original piece of ceramics from Belize that, that was featured in our Maya exhibit. And uh, what I was tasked with doing was making reproduction ceramics that could go in this exhibit. And that was really a fun process for me. I, I love making pottery and uh, I got a chance to working off of photographs make uh, make ceramics that that looked uh, you know close enough to the originals that we could use them in the final exhibit. Uh, that was a really fun process, and the, the surprising part of it was I, I went to all this work of uh, making and finishing the pieces, making it look as close to the original as possible, 
uh, only to put it on the floor and uh, and smash it. Because what we needed was not a finished piece of pottery. We had we had the original to show in the exhibit, but we needed these shards so that we could use them in a diorama. And that was really fun for me. You just got to make sure you break the right one when the time comes, or you'll be in big trouble with the collections, folks. But here it is in place in uh, uh, a burial scene that was part of the Maya exhibit. So for me, that was really that was one of the highlights of my time here was getting a chance to to bring those skills in. It just breaks my heart to see <laughs> that beautiful pottery broken, but I guess that's that's part of the gig. Yep. So there, <laughs> there are lots of questions coming in. Uh, the first one comes from Susan asking, what skills or training are required to become a fabricator? Well, we have people that have come to us from a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, I would say, uh, in addition to just having uh, really solid uh, three-dimensional reasoning skills and an aptitude for fixing things and, and being handy. The, uh, uh, a real passion for science is, is one of the biggest requirements. Uh, and so the people that come here, they tend to already be what I would call science nerds, and that's how I self-identify. Uh, but it's people that have skills working with their hands. Uh, we have people that come to us with a background in physics, electrical engineering, but also uh, people that are sculptors. Uh, people that come to us from technical theater. So they were building sets or making props. Uh, I even have one person on staff who used to build hot rod cars uh, from scratch. So all the welding required and just, I mean, incredible fabrication skills. So it's, it's a pretty wide range of, of people. Yeah. Great. Uh, the next question comes from Sandy and I'm Sandy, I'm not sure I'm getting this right, but I think she's asking, um, you make exhibits for museum for other museums as well. Can you talk a little bit about how you set up those relationships? Sure. Uh, so it's really an important part of our work. Uh, working with other institutions is a chance for us to extend our mission. You know, it's uh, informal science education is important here uh, at the Science Museum in Minnesota, but we can extend that to, to other places all over the world, uh, like the current exhibit exhibits we're building for a museum in Kuwait. Uh, those relationships are, are built uh, over years of doing this work. We've been, we've been at this for decades and we're a, a, a world uh, recognized leader in, in producing exhibits. We have the staff that is able to do the research and the design and uh, manage these, these large projects. And so we built up relationships and a reputation over a lot of years to do this. So um, in addition to kind of extending our reach uh, and, and getting important work in front of more people. Uh, it's also a, an important source of revenue for the museum. So it's, it's, it's great that we can uh, take advantage of the need. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Amanda asks a similar question. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add about the kind of background or education people might pursue to become a fabricator or did you get that the last? Anything else you might add there? Uh, one thing that's becoming more and more important for us, uh, we, we produce uh, a lot of exhibits that uh, are operated by Arduino and other microcontrollers or require computer programming skills. So coding is becoming uh, more and more important. You saw the, uh, for a few of the images I showed, uh, the ability to do 3D drafting. So CAD work uh, is really helpful because we can model things first before we uh, either make it on the 3D printer or make it out on the mill. Uh, so those, those computer skills are becoming uh, basically a standard uh, in the toolkit now, where it used to just be table saws and, and other hand tools. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, now we have a question from Eleanor, who's nine years old. Do you take exhibits out to put in new ones? Maybe you can talk about that process a little bit. We do. We have uh, a couple different kinds of exhibits, I would say. We have what we call a permanent exhibit, which might be on the floor for a few years or even 10 years, uh, like the Sportsology exhibit. I don't know if you've been here and seen that one. So that one we built in place and it's going to be here for a good long time. And then we have the temporary exhibits. So right now I mentioned the skin exhibit that, that we we're just putting in, putting the finishing touches on. Uh, that's a collaboration with the California Academy. And that will be here uh, through the end of the summer or something like that. So we, we have these temporary exhibits that we'll build uh, or, or host, and then we send them off to a new location. So it's a combination. And then we have shorter term experiences like the upcoming cardboard gallery 
uh, which might only run for a few months, but it's the chance for people to come and try something new uh, and, then, uh, and then get something else uh, in there. So Olivia asks, uh, where do you put the exhibits that you have completed? They're pretty big. They are big. So uh, for the, the exhibits that we complete and build for someone else, we have to ship them off to that institution and then install them. So uh, it could be sending something uh, out to San Francisco or having to ship it across the ocean to uh, like the project we have now in Kuwait. So uh, it really varies. Um, and then the ones that we build in house, we, we do have to take up in pieces and we have to build things in small enough pieces they'll fit up the elevator so we can get them up to the exhibit galleries. Uh Let's see. Oh, I've got one more question here from Susan. What happens to exhibits at the end of their life in a museum? A couple of different things happen. Uh, we have uh, some really good relationships with other institutions that, let's say we, we have had an exhibit like our, our cell lab, which was really successful for us. And we have another institution that would like to host that. And we're ready to, to put in some new content on our floor. So the, the, in an ideal situation, we can decommission it from our space and send it off to have a second life in a new institution. So that, that's one thing that happens. Uh, there, sometimes we do have to uh, just salvage what we can out of and reuse the parts that we can from existing exhibits to build a new one. Uh, and then we recycle all of our materials. Uh, so recycle the steel and the wood goes to a, a, a construction waste recycler. So we try to minimize our waste stream if there are things that have come to the end of their life. It's really important to us. It's part of our, our ethic here. Great. Wow, I feel like we could uh, we could talk about all of this for, for so long. It's just such a, a wonderful thing that we have right in our building. Um, Andrew, thank you so much. This has been a really fascinating conversation. Yeah. Um, and uh, thanks to all of you for all of your support as well. Um, I wanna end with a couple of notes because uh, actually, Andrew brought something up that I think will be really pertinent to all of you. Some of you may have seen the announcement that the museum is reopening. Um, and in fact, that's happening next week. So I wanted to just drop into the chat. This is a link where you can learn more about our reopening and we hope that you can come in and see uh, all of our wonderful exhibits at the museum. Um, soon. <laughs> uh, so, so do check that out. And uh, I want to remind all of you too that uh, we are still doing a lot of Member Appreciation Month uh, programming throughout uh, February. So if you visit smm.org backslash thanks, you can see what's coming up. We really, really appreciate your support. And then the last thing I want to do since I have all of you on the call is I just want to get a little bit of super fast input from all of you. So we've learned a lot about virtual events this month and we've really appreciated appreciated all of you, your support and your commentary about that. And uh, as part of that, I want to just get a sense from all of you um, what kind of timing works the best. So uh, if all of you can look at the screen I'm about to share, I'm going to share six options um, that we're really interested in. So if you could just um, look at them for about 10 seconds and then in the chat, put which option you like the best. So I'm gonna share it uh, right now. So hopefully all of you can see that. Um, and it just really helps me, our chat we're tracking and I'll be able to save that later. So um, I know this isn't a fancy Zoom poll. It turned out that I don't have administrative rights to set up a fancy Zoom poll. So I'm working on that. But if you could just put on the chat, whether you prefer weekday mornings between 10 and noon, weekdays over lunch between noon and two, weekday evenings between six and 8 p.m., weekday mornings between 10 a.m. and noon, weekend afternoons between two and four, or weekend evenings between 6 and 8 p.m. That would be great. Just drop that right into the chat. I'm gonna give everybody about 20 more seconds to do that. This really helps us as we're planning our virtual events moving forward. So thank you in advance for just writing in which one you prefer. This is the super fun part of the program. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. I see lots of commentary coming in. If you have any other thoughts on timing, feel free to drop that into the chat as well. All 
All right. Thank you very much. Well, with that, I want to say this is the first um, morning tour that we've ended even close to on time, <laughs> uh, which is which is fantastic. Uh, Andrew, you prepared a wonderful presentation. All of you, thank you so much for joining us. Um, next week, our virtual tour is our last virtual member appreciation month tour. So on Saturday, we'll be doing a tour with um, Joanne Jones Reezy, uh, who's our VP of, oh, shoot, I'm going to get it wrong, no matter what I say. Um, education, inclusion, and science um, is going to be giving us a walk, a virtual walkthrough of the, the refurbished race exhibit uh, in the Science Museum. And she'll be joined by Odia Wood Krieger, who works on its sister exhibit, The Bias Inside Us, which we uh, developed in partnership with the Smithsonian Institution. So we hope we'll see you for that. Uh, we're also doing a fun trivia event on Thursday night with Trivia Mafia. And as you know, we have lots more fun stuff coming up for members at smm.org backslash thanks. Uh, we're so grateful for your commitment to bold science, fun, and lifelong learning. So thank you for your member support. Andrew, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. You can all go into your reaction buttons and give him a little applause uh, icon if you want, just like I just did. Uh, and uh, we'll see you very soon in person and online. Thank you.